every spy cannot be james bond in fact nobody can be james bond james bond gets identified and killed within a day of showing up and announcing himself the russians have since day one they were completely silent they haven't put their uh, famed propaganda networks to use in this so america is a reliable power where america's interests are concerned the the establishment in the united states especially the department of state at least till the last decade was enamored of pakistan uh, ayub khan famously remarked that uh, one muslim soldier is, uh, pakistani muslim soldier is equal to 10 indian hindu soldiers right and he was disproved in 65 71 99 very badly a very good evening welcome to this joint podcast hosted by swarajya and bharat varta i'm extremely privileged to be joined by a spy fiction novelist shonak agar khetkar Shonak, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. It's really a privilege to have you here on our podcast. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, first of all, it must be very exciting because India does not have a lot of uh, spy writers in that sense because we've evolved around a culture of secrecy when it comes to our strategic, you know, circles in that right. sense. So there's a lot of things that the public actually does not know and the rest of it you know we would just be guessing around it but it would be largely conspiracy theories but let me begin by asking you the most simple question what got you into writing this genre and how has it been so far that's not that's not really a simple question but uh, it's a good one i've i've been a, a fan of the genre since childhood so i i don't know how old i was exactly but uh, my parents snuck me into the movie theater to watch a james bond movie I, i was in school at that time and obviously it was kind of borderline illegal i enjoyed the movie and a few others and uh, that's that's how uh, i got started in the genre later on um, i i watched uh, classics like uh, the guns of navarone and uh, very good day Alistair MacLean, uh, which are based on Alistair MacLean's novels, and then I read those novels, and that got me hooked. So I've been reading this genre for about thirty uh, years now. It's it's one of my favorites. So uh, writing in it uh, wasn't really, you know, uh, something I had to think of consciously. It's just something that interests me. But as somebody who consumes a lot of literature, whether it's books or movies, yeah, on say, um, you know, espionage in general, mm-hmm. uh, I how. what's your perception of how india has done in terms of producing literature like that be it the movies or uh, books a uh, loaded question but so uh, we are producing uh, cultural artifacts in this genre but it's not really a complaint but my crib about it is uh, there's a lot of uh, dramatization exaggeration in what which yeah. really does disservice to the genre itself and to the profession every spy cannot be james bond in fact nobody can be james bond james bond gets identified and killed within a day of showing up and announcing himself it doesn't really make sense no i i i actually can recall this one particular interview i think it was on the quint mm-hmm. where uh, mr vikram sood was speaking soon after his retirement and in this interview the interviewer asks him about you know the indian equivalent of james bond and how espionage works mm-hmm. in india and then he had to break it down and simplify and tell them that it's not all hunky dory and uh, you know romanticized as you may actually see in the movies it's actually much more complex and that it entails a lot more thinking than what movies portray them to be right right uh, i mean uh, think about it james bond shows up uh, i i think this is oh. from golden eye he shows up he announces himself to the villain's girlfriend or wife whoever she is and then he proceeds to dance with her uh, take her to a hotel room uh, at that point of time he logically should be dead or behind bars in some way or the other it, it doesn't work that way i don't think it works that way in any any intelligence agency uh, across the world definitely not in india how much do you think a uh, human spies are uh, relevant today especially because we have various other sources of I- intelligence gathering so uh, you do have other sources of intelligence gathering but how likely are you to get the kind of intelligence you need uh, or rather let me put it this way are the other sources going to give you insight into what your adversaries are thinking into their thought process if they've documented everything and you've sto- you managed to steal those documents brilliant uh, that might give you some insight but uh those would typically be work products right no one actually documents the process by which they've arrived at a particular conclusion 
and that that train of thought is also critical to understand where uh, your adversary might go in the future it is important uh, human sources are definitely important you, you you can tell by the manner in which both the people's republic of china and the united states are going about trying to infiltrate each other's human systems there was this uh, very famous uh, case 6 7 years ago where the chinese uh, ministry of state security uh, identified and eliminated dozens of american spies in china the way they went about doing that uh, if if you go by american uh, court records uh, is uh, they they turned uh, a cia agent a retired cia agent who was living in hong kong they gave him money uh, that was the incentive he was given and uh, he identified their uh, communication systems for the chinese and once they had identified that given that they've got the technology in place in the great firewall of china they were able to trace other agents uh, who were using that same system so i right. believe uh, uh, dozens were uh, apprehended uh, a few were shot in front of their colleagues uh, to send a message and the cia was left uh, you know uh, struggling to understand what had happened i think it was the ministry of state security itself uh, if i'm not mistaken i was reading a white paper this was almost 2 years ago so my information may be outdated the chinese are now employing a lot of its own uh, people in the diaspora whether it's in the united states yes. or otherwise to gather intelligence they filter it down and then they arrive at a certain conclusion if a particular tip is actually worth uh, you know looking into or not yeah so in that sense how much do you think the chinese have infiltrated into say public institutions like colleges and universities we also heard the uk make a statement about confucius institutes right. earlier this week they have definitely succeeded in infiltrating a number of uh, institutions uh, educational institutions primarily but uh, research uh, and otherwise uh, their approach at least for a certain period of time and uh, this was right from the 1960s i believe was to uh, encourage uh their diaspora to send whatever information they could they weren't tasked specifically go and get me this piece of information from this particular location or this particular organization it was more along the lines of okay wonderful you work at this place whatever anything that interest th- interests you or anything that you think might be interesting to us just send it across to us whenever you can and then they collected all this data from disparate sources and then they filter through it analyze it and then put the pieces together if if that still holds then um, any student in institution of higher learning in the west who originates from china is is, is a potential mss uh, agent the if you look at their weapons development program they they've made massive strides which are very unlikely unless they have access to intelligence from those research institutions right and before we go further um, i would you know what are your areas of interest as in uh, since you write spy novels is there a certain area that you focus on and do tell us about the books that you've written and your latest book nuclear espionage is definitely an area of interest uh, and uh, within that of course the india pakistan uh, dynamic uh, starting from the 1970s all the way to 1990 and beyond that is definitely uh, a huge interest of mine and that's where my novels are based so i have a, a series of four spy novels it's called the lead bhutto eat grass series and it begins in 1974 uh, right after our own uh, nuclear test at pokhran pokhran 1 uh, which was called a peaceful nuclear explosion and uh, so to provide our viewers some context uh at that point of time uh, it, it was just 3 years since uh, pakistan was bisected by india uh, you had uh, east pakistan becoming bangladesh and they were absolutely paranoid about further losses of territory uh, bhutto in fact uh, he became prime minister after the 1971 war and uh, as 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 soon as january 1972 i believe it was 24th of january he called all his uh, scientists to multan and he had a meeting with them where he told them look boss we need nuclear weapons please take concrete steps towards developing them unfortunately for him it was beyond their capabilities at that point of time they struggled right after our nuclear explosion in 1974 the pakistani establishment was in full blown panic and at that point of time uh, they received uh, a letter bhutto received a letter personally offering help in terms of technology 
for developing nuclear weapons. So that is where my uh, novels start. And uh, it follows Indian intelligence's efforts to identify the source of that letter and then to contain it, to eliminate it, etc. So uh, which part of this is fictionalized? I'm, 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 I know that you can't give away a lot of the things, but do give us an insight into how you've actually made this interesting for the readers and uh, how uh, basically it entails a lot of imagination and uh, yes. war gaming yes. essentially yes so it has to be a lot of fun and when you're writing something like this you have multiple possibilities that uh, can be put down hmm. in the book hmm. so how do you uh, narrow down on a particular thing so uh, okay uh, let me start with the fiction non-fiction split as you proceed from book one to book four the fictional content increases uh, that that is a straight line trend at the same time uh, I'm not claiming to have written a book which is very close to reality because there is no way for me personally to um, validate that. So I can't make that claim. What I have done is I've identified certain anchoring points in history which are available, which are confirmed or corroborated by people in the know uh, in public sources. And what I've done is I've tried to weave fiction around those anchoring points. As you mentioned, there are multiple possibilities that can be taken. That's, that's a very astute observation. Um, the choice uh, in the end boils down to what is realistic. So I'll give you an example. In, in my first book, Indian intelligence is trying to identify the source of that letter. That letter has come from somewhere in Europe. They know the general area and they're trying to find out who sent it. This is 1974 or 1975. Uh, there are no computers. There's no internet. Uh, records are all paper-based. And records from a foreign country are not easy to obtain. So how do they go about identifying that guy or finding that guy? It involves trawling through public sources, leaning on diplomats to get them information from visa processing centers. But again, those can only be for Indian uh, applicants, not from visa processing centers, sorry, the passport office. But those can be uh, only for Indians. They're looking for a non-Indian, right? That's, that's right. a huge challenge. So uh, identifying a realistic way, eliminating everything that is fantasy at that point of time, this has been my process. And and to, uh, I, I don't want to leave the viewers hanging. So the way they go about it is they identify universities in the target country and they get alumni books and then they trawl through them, which is a very tedious process. And that is how they chance upon potential suspects. I think uh, this is uh, one of the ways in which they actually found out in reality, right? Uh, because the Pakistanis placed a huge order of winter wear, I think. This was ahead of Kargil, if I'm not mistaken. This was in 1984. This was ahead of uh, Operation Meghdoot. Okay. So, uh, what what stories do we know uh, today that have been declassified? On What do you generally think about this system of secrecy that we have? Do you think that adds as an advantage or do you think uh, we should be much more open about it after a point of time, say like the UK or any other Western country? Right. So A, I don't think we declassify anything from our intelligence files. I, I, I personally haven't seen anything of that sort. So what we have to rely on are uh, accounts by insiders. Mr. B. Raman, uh, is one such insider, uh, Mr. Vikram Sood is another. Uh, their books are treasure troves uh, as far as people like me are concerned because they, they haven't gone into excruciating detail, of course. They are restricted by their own service rules, but they've they've put in hints here and there and you can, of course, read between the lines. Uh, that That's how the whole thing proceeds in India. As far as declassification in, in the manner that the US and the UK go about it is concerned, uh, that depends on how maturely we can take it. And the media has a huge role to play in that. If we do declassify intelligence files and they end up being, uh, you know, hyped or uh, dramatized needlessly in the media, then uh, of course uh, the purpose is defeated because you declassify to disseminate and encourage wider analysis. Uh, there's there's nothing else to be gained from that, right? But if if it's going to be uh, hyped up and uh, it's going to be uh, dramatized, then that purpose is defeated. I'm not sure uh, it would be the right way to go about in India at least. But I think this curiosity is largely restricted to Pakistan alone when it yes. comes to India and yes. Indians demanding it. Yes. But there's a lot of confusion when it comes to 
say a layman's understanding of what is happening in the sino indian border mm-hmm. uh, even today a lot of people don't have an understanding because there are multiple sources within india which says you know uh, the chinese soldiers have eaten away this much part of our territory right. so in that sense uh, how much can how much and how can you rely on uh, rely on osint uh, you know information that's out there so what's your approach to uh, analyzing such information so i don't rely on osint uh, because uh, there's there's too much garbage in that to be honest any tom dick and harry starts an account on twitter claiming to be an osintologist and 3 uh, weeks later he's got 50000 followers and he's putting out complete garbage uh, which doesn't even make sense but uh, it gets retweeted to heaven and uh, everyone believes that i think that's the most honest answer everybody wanted to hear <laughs> garbage man it's garbage i mean that there are valuable bits of information inside it but you have to you have to take it with a pinch of salt maybe garbage is not the right term for it but the the, the signal to noise ratio is too skewed towards noise right no it and it adds to a lot of confusion uh, as it is definitely uh, if you remember uh, after the uh, the pulwama bombings when uh, we did the balakot uh, strikes and then you had the pakistanis try and attack us the next day the pakistan air force osint accounts were going nuts uh, mentioning you know uh, uh, 50 plane detachment has taken off from here and uh, 45 plane detachment has taken off from there bombs have landed x y z places etc etc none of that had happened but you know someone tweets it and then the osint guys just start amplifying it like crazy because they want to be the first one to put it out for their uh, readers Uh, there's that that uh, feedback loop which gets activated and then it's nuts so the, the the incentive for uh osent accounts is to be first it is not to be yeah. right because no one really goes back and checks uh, uh, yeah. you mentioned this but that did not happen so now you're failed it doesn't happen that way right the incentives are all skewed yeah they're the pap- paparazzis of the Absolutely. strategic community <laughs> that's, that's, that's brilliant <laughs> but uh, when you don't have an active diaspora yeah. or even a space where you can have a lot of human intelligence being transferred back to your home country mm. even with advanced technologies that countries like india today have mm. how do you go about in terms of your approach to gathering intelligence say with countries like china mm. who we face an existential threat from the the approach that they utilize is to uh, recruit uh, assets uh, so th- theoretically there are four levers which can be used to recruit an asset uh, they form a very nice acronym mice m i c money ideology uh, compromise and ego uh, money is an obvious uh, it's too obvious to explain ideology again it's fairly straightforward uh, compromise is uh, honey trapping someone and uh, ego is identifying someone who's not happy or dissatisfied with his or her position in the organization and playing up on that uh, i believe that that is the approach uh, our guys take anyway even in the absence of uh, an active diaspora to recruit from um, since you may have been following the ukraine uh, russia conflict mm-hmm. that's been going on yeah there's a lot of information and psychological warfare going on from day 1 Yes. I think even from the Ukrainian side you could see a lot of PR activities that that's being carried out. Yes. So public diplomacy as a subject has been very close to me and I've mm-hmm. I've written about this and I've researched about this as a student as well. And one thing that I've actually felt is that India is way too behind when it comes to public diplomacy. Right. I mean obviously there's there's no secrecy as such when it comes to public diplomacy largely mm-hmm. because it's it's all done in public knowledge. Right. Uh, you look at something like afghanistan mm-hmm. and what happened with the united states there yeah. and how they actually work on perception management mm. and in spite of all that they've actually failed do you think india does not need such efforts for public diplomacy or why is it that we are lagging behind so uh, taking the russia ukraine example all of the public diplomacy or uh, propaganda effort uh, you see on the internet is uh, well not all but 90 95% of it is ukrainian back uh, so you've got ukraine you've got the uk and the us these these three uh, entities are uh, really pushing their message uh, left right and center the russians have uh, haven't really attempted to do that since day one they were completely silent 
they haven't put their uh, famed propaganda networks to use in this and that is something that i not just us it's it's baffling uh, experts as well what are the russians doing is that because they're more focused on the kinetic part of the conflict than this i mean it can happen simultaneously right because it's not the same people doing both right i mean the guy who does propaganda is not the guy who fights on the battlefield uh, so uh, it's not that you know they can't do it they could if they wanted to either they've decided not to do it or something is preventing them i have no way of knowing what is the case in this but uh, this forms a brilliant case study on how effective propaganda ultimately is towards the final outcome uh, whichever way it goes and uh, the ukrainians have done brilliantly in that regard they are pushing propaganda like crazy uh, especially in the first few months of war uh, it it kind of backfired uh, because many of the things that they pushed were fantastical you had uh, ghost of kiev shooting down i don't know i and the last count i read was 20 odd russian yeah. aircraft <laughs> this is gas <laughs> then you had uh, I, uh, they they recently came out uh, it wasn't the ukrainians it was british newspapers which came out with a photograph of a, a ukrainian pensioner uh, holding a double barrel uh, rifle with the claim that uh, that guy had shot down either a drone or a helicopter with that rifle and mm-hmm. uh, he was being felicitated for it again it's it stretches credibility and uh, a lot of people online and i can see that on twitter they've kind of soured about it because uh, they feel uh, taken advantage of they, if you if you just uh, do a casual search of your own twitter feed the number of ukrainian flags uh, against uh, profiles has really gone down in the past few months whether that is uh, people saying on the propaganda or whether it's you know reality starting to bite in terms of energy costs uh, yeah i wouldn't uh, dare to comment on that but it is a phenomenon i'm observing yeah because uh, even i was speaking to a few senior military officials mm-hmm. uh, retired ones uh, who've been observing the conflict uh, for a while, uh, f- since since it began right. and obviously there was this streak of misinformation and propaganda which was mm-hmm. continuously being carried out so today even if the ukrainians claim that they've taken over a particular uh, part of territory that was occupied by right. the russians mm-hmm. nobody is actually willing to buy it yeah because there's not a lot of solid evidence uh, that's being actually put out because there is such amount of information overload that's out there right uh, because in the first part of the war uh, these same accounts put out claims which were then proven to be completely false so credibility is uh, is if it isn't gone already it's hanging by a thread and people aren't so willing to trust these sources anymore they want corroboration they want proof how effective do you think state machineries are today in the age of social media because usually when you open any russian media's uh, social media account on twitter you can see that it's an affiliated right. media of the russian government or something right. like that right you know how much do people actually trust this sort of information so they might not trust those uh, those particular sources but uh, as far as uh, state institutions or state backed institutions are concerned most of the propaganda coming out of uh, the ukrainian side is state backed the ukrainians have an entity uh, I, i believe the acronyms are cispo the british have an entity uh, i'd rather not name it uh, but it's there it's it's you can look it up on wikipedia and the americans definitely have these accounts so these guys are out there pumping information into social media social media is a battlefield for this particular propaganda war and uh, these are all state backed entities or state employees directly so like and uh, this this not much knowledge about india's information and uh, psychological warfare hmm. aspect of things so you know obviously since you're very passionate about this how much do we actually know about this uh, particular aspect of warfare so uh, i've had these conversations with a few people and the, the 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 summary is do we actually have these entities do we have an information warfare team forget about it but very convenient to deny no i mean do do you see it anywhere did you see it during pulwama and afterwards during balakot or after that right in fact i think they were internally focused if it was if it was anything else because there was a, a conspiracy raised around whether it actually happened i mean the balakot yeah. strikes i forget about the conspiracy part that was political because uh, you know obviously elections were right there and uh, the opposition had to deny these guys credit they were just trying to fling mud and see what sticks but uh, think about it uh, 
on uh, the day after the Balakot strike, when the Pakistani jets tried to infiltrate our airspace and uh, bomb our formations, if you were on Twitter, and I was at that point of time, uh, we went from uh, random accounts, you know, baying for war, completely pumped up. We want to do this. Let's bash those, bash their heads in, etc., etc. Then you had uh, news of Wing Commander uh, Abhinandan's aircraft getting shot down. First, it was, you know, uh, nobody believed it. Then videos started coming in. Then people started believing it. A few journalists uh, put out cryptic tweets that, yes, it might be real. And then you had a 180 degree flip where those same accounts that were baying for blood in the morning started, you know, saying, do whatever it takes, but get him back alive, get him back, back fine. I don't care. Give whatever the, the Pakis want and stuff like that. Now, I am convinced that a significant part of that was driven by Pakistan's uh, Directorate General of uh, Inter-Services Public Relations, DGISPR. Uh, but there were Indian accounts that fell for it or Indian accounts that felt it. And they were putting their emotions out there. So within that day, the sentiment turned 180 degrees and there was absolutely nothing on the Indian side to sort of counter that or to redirect it and show people the broader picture, except maybe a, a handful of veterans who were saying, what did you expect? This is war. People get shot down. People die. Hold your horses. Let the people in charge do their jobs. Stop you know, demanding things, demanding that things happen instantaneously, but they were right. drowned out. So I don't think we have anything of that sort. At least we didn't have it in 2019. And uh, right. I'm pretty sure uh, the Air Force has identified this. Well, maybe not the just the Air Force, the services have identified it. Yeah, they've identified this gap. Whether they've plugged right. it or not, I'm, I'm, I, I have no idea. Uh, what are the uh, spy stories that you've been very fascinated about? Uh, it may not be only related to India, but around the world. Oh, uh, so uh, there are so many. Uh, I, I also run a Substack, which is focused on espionage. And uh, I try to write a short story about a real life uh, espionage incident. Uh, we'll, we'll put the link in the description. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. There are so many over there. Uh, one was... Uh, uh, an RNAW uh, officer named Ravinder Singh, who defected to the United States uh, via Nepal. He had been spying for the Americans for a considerable amount of time before that. And uh, once RNAW got suspicious of him, because he was asking questions which he had no business asking, and he was Xeroxing a heck of a lot of fights, uh, they started, uh, they put him under surveillance, I believe, and uh, they sent him home, basically. And, you know, boss files lot out, ghar jao. we'll figure out what to do later. And uh, he and his wife, they they were driven to Nepal uh, from Delhi. Uh, over there, they were received by uh, an American embassy staffer named David Vakala. You can look him up. He's on LinkedIn also. I think he's a contractor now, uh, oldish guy, who got them fresh American passports and uh, put them up, uh, put them on an airplane uh, to Washington the next day. Once they reached there, their passports were taken. And uh, Ravinder Singh had a very sorry ending because uh, within a few weeks or months of his landing there, the CIA basically uh, washed its hands of him. Uh, he might have been promised certain uh, things like a position uh, in a think tank, basically right. a sinecure to sustain a, a, a comfortable lifestyle over there. But he didn't get any of that. And uh, I believe he passed away in 2015 or 16. That, that was a okay. fascinating story. I mean, this is one of the things that um, today people are complaining about, especially if you remember the scene from Kabul airport when the American exited all of a sudden and so many people and the Taliban kept on repeating the point that these are the traitors who want to run away and right. nobody else. Right. The other people are calmly in their house. They know what will happen. They would have expected this day to happen. Hmm. You know, uh, uh, even with Ukraine, initially there was a lot of hesitancy whether America is even going to support Ukraine in this particular war. Right. So that way, America is a reliable power. Do you think that value is decreasing? So America is a reliable power where America's interests are concerned. Uh, if they do not see it in their yeah. interest to... Act that should be on a t-shirt. I'm going to... I'm going to trademark that phrase <laughs> but <laughs> it's the truth i mean look in 1965 uh, pakistan and especially uh, ayub khan they they were of the opinion that the americans uh, had their backs because pakistan was a member of ceto and cento they were uh, getting a heck of a lot of american military equipment uh, including tanks patent tanks and uh, they were completely convinced that uh, the us had their backs 
and so they start their misadventure uh, in 1965 which uh, the indian army then punched back and uh, we ended up uh, conquering their territory rather than the other way around they had hoped to liberate uh, jammu and kashmir and what happened was we were sitting on the outskirts of lahore the americans didn't do anything at that point of time uh, in fact they sanctioned both uh, pakistan and india for uh, weapon sales yeah. which which was uh, which was basically against pakistan because we weren't really buying weapons from them at that point of time that has had a very strong impact on the pakistani security establishment psyche they still uh, insist that they have to cater to their own security needs they cannot rely on allies but um, i don't know because there's a lot of ambiguity on that front hmm. um you look at the withdrawal of support for pakistan especially when trump was around hmm. now one may say that it's a political decision but i personally think that it's beyond that okay. it's a strategic calculation hmm. because obviously they needed to please india at some point and i think the trump administration was also trying to get very close to india and i think they even wooed us with f35s at one point of time if i'm not mistaken um and that obviously didn't work out you look at the funding being cut at one point just 2 mm. 3 years ago yeah. and again they're making a deal for f16 right so is this being enabled because pakistan has nuclear weapons i mean it may be a very reductive argument but it does hold some truth so this has been happening since before they got nuclear weapons the americans uh, after the 1971 fiasco when they had actually sent a carrier battle group uh, into the bay of bengal uh, that was the high point of their support for pakistan uh, in the 70s uh, towards 1977 jimmy carter had actually uh, stopped all military aid to pakistan it was uh, well pakistan has been extremely lucky because uh, within a few months the soviets invaded afghanistan and then the american establishment again did a 180 degree turn and uh, pakistan became their best friend this continued all the way until the end of the soviet occupation of afghanistan at which point uh, the americans again dropped the pakistanis i mean they stopped giving billions in aid but they had promised uh, certain weapon systems they had already sold f16s they had promised more that's when pakistan fell afoul of uh, the pressler amendment and uh, george right. bush refused to certify that pakistan did not have nuclear weapons the consequence of that the the f16 uh, sale fell through but 4 uh, years later bill clinton reversed that uh, entirely so aid was again going to pakistan from the united states within 4 years of that uh, decision by george bush so they've always been like this uh, it's always you know reverting to being bum chums with pakistan there's there's nothing surprising about the f16 sale and as it coincides with democrats being in power uh, especially lately since the clinton regime but don't you think that's beyond the binaries i mean obviously it does it hold is. true that they it have is. a sense of uh, they probably have a soft corner because of their political um, leanings uh, but but it's much more beyond that don't you think it is uh, so the the establishment in the united states especially the department of state at least till the last decade was enamored of pakistan uh, as a consequence of which uh, they kept getting sweet deals from the us because the bureaucrats who were uh, putting up these proposals were completely uh, you know of the opinion that uh, pakistan was a, a massive ally of the united states and critical to regional security uh, that's that's one phrase that uh, we've heard quite often uh, you might have heard of robin rafael who used to be yeah. uh, a diplomat uh, in the department of state uh, she was uh, absolutely she she was practically a, a lobbyist i mean she has been described by a, f- uh, a few very knowledgeable people as a lobbyist for the pakistani state in right. the department of state so i was actually going to uh, arrive at this because the lobbying efforts that the pakistanis have is actually tremendous uh, in the united states and in some some of the countries as well and obviously with china they're so close so why do you think india has actually lagged b- behind when it comes to lobbying or uh, also to put it in this way in what form does lobbying actually happen as far as india is concerned okay uh, so indian lo- uh, lobbying efforts uh, at least in terms of their outcomes have lagged behind the pakistanis by a considerable amount there's there's no denying that but is it because the pakistanis have lobbied so much better or is it because american interests actually coincided with what the pakistanis were lobbying for 
are we to believe that uh, Pakistani lobbying caused America to forget its interests, its core interests in this region and uh, do whatever they were being told? I don't, I don't buy that, man. It's, uh, it's a convenient excuse that the Pakistanis lobby so well. That is why the US listens to them and gives them all these sweetheart deals. But I don't see that happening. Yet. That's just a convenient excuse. Absolutely. They, at and, least till the last decade, at least till uh, mm-hmm. Obama's term, they had a strong interest in uh, maintaining close ties with the Pakistani regime. Trump came and disrupted that, but only to an extent. Now you see them right. kind of, you know, leaning back towards it. They're not going to go as uh, close to Pakistan as they used to be because now their interests are better served by being close to India. And that kind of precludes <sighs> A close relationship with Pakistan to an extent. But again, it's about their interests. It's not about lobbying or, uh, you know, anything that we can do. When you actually look at all these developments, do you think the possibility of denuclear denuclearization of Pakistan is almost impossible? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the Pakistani nuclear arsenal uh, at this point of time is probably larger than ours. Uh, it's more diverse than ours is. Their doctrine is quite different from India's and China's nuclear doctrine. A consequence of that is, whereas uh, while India and China maintain their nuclear warheads in centralized locations under uh, strict civilian control, in the case of uh, China, it's a uh, CCP commissar in control of the warheads themselves. Uh, In Pakistan, there is a lot of ambiguity because their doctrine says we may use nuclear weapons first and uh, we may not necessarily use them on uh, counter value targets, which is like, you know, we might not necessarily attack cities of our enemies. We may attack their uh, military formations also if we believe that the Pakistani state is threatened. That would require those warheads to be available to field commanders, military commanders, right? Uh, because uh, otherwise, if they're centralized, they are uh, they are vulnerable to attack. They are vulnerable to disruption in that. Manner. Now, if they're dispersed uh, with field commanders all over the place, then how are you going to denuclear, denuclearize that uh, country? It it just makes the problem that much more difficult, right? Which is why the entire problem with uh, black weapons is also there. I mean, there's a huge black market for weapons in. Pakistan, which exists even today uh, yes. in that particular region. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you look at it, uh, probably is it is it because the nature of that territory has been like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, so geopolitically, they've been uh, facing conflicts for the last 300, 400 years. If you look at NWFP right. and Cyber right. and all right. of those areas, uh, even today, so even, even if the Pakistan state is largely involved in the Taliban getting a substantial amount of power mm-hmm. and today they're in the in the government mm-hmm. it's again backfiring so uh, is that strategic depth that they aimed for mm-hmm. how much of that exists today according mm-hmm. to you so if you look at uh, the events that have happened since uh, the Taliban took over you had the then director general of uh, inter-services intelligence uh, go to Kabul he was spotted there he spoke with a few people there were videos and uh, he was all smug over there but uh, since then uh, the tehreek-e taliban pakistan have basically uh, declared war on the pakistani state they are conducting attacks on border districts uh, with practically with impunity and uh, the pakistanis are suffering casualties over there there are there are videos of uh, the ttp demolishing the fence that the pakistanis had built on the durand line because they don't accept the durand line they want a greater pashtunistan so they, they, they haven't gotten strategic depth in fact uh, their their other border has become hostile to them that coupled with what is going on in balochistan uh, suggests that Pakistan's security environment is actually degraded rather than, you know, becoming better for them. Now, even the Sindhis are getting vocal with their demand. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, they they, uh, they gambled on getting uh, a subservient government in Afghanistan who would control everything because right. they had Sirajuddin Haqqani placed over there as Minister of Defense. But that hasn't worked out for them because Haqqani himself isn't really kotoing to Islamabad. Yes, even before he was not. Not really. But they, they believed they could control him. They thought they could right. control him. Now they're 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 struggling to figure out what to do with the Durand line. Now they're they, they're having to deploy forces over there, which they would not have expected to do. 
so maybe this false sense of power that pakistan has is that genetic problem that it's uh, facing since its birth yeah i mean ayub khan famously remarked that uh, one muslim soldier is uh, pakistani muslim soldier is equal to 10 indian hindu soldiers right and he was disproved in 65 71 99 very badly but i don't think they've learned a lesson from that but uh, why was there uh, what what was the context behind that the context was you know he was absolutely certain that despite our Our numerical superiority in terms of manpower in the armed forces, the Pakistanis could defeat us, and this was the justification he gave. And this is uh, so. This is an aspect of the mythology that the Pakistan Army have built around themselves because they consume, or rather, they control more than a quarter of Pakistan's economy, and they derive the spoils from it. Uh, if you become a three-star officer in the Pakistan Army, or you're, you're given hundreds of acres of land. prime agricultural land you basically become a feudal lord right right so in order to derive benefits like that from the government you have to convince the people that you are indispensable they've done that by propping india up as the adversary which didn't take a lot of effort because of uh, everything that happened before and during partition and they've portrayed themselves as the only bulwark against us so there's there's a particular pattern to it i mean if you look at any general who rises usually mm-hmm. he poses a threat against the establishment and the establishment loses and i think it's it's the same repetitive pattern that's been recurring since the last 6 uh, to 7 decades but is it really the establishment i i don't believe the civilian government of pakistan is the establishment just uh, public relations shonak thank you so much for joining me for this chat it was very lovely speaking to you there's a lot more territories we couldn't cover and hopefully we'll be able to cover that do tell us what's in store for the future because when it comes to I mean I would 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 you be offended if I said that all your writing efforts is also a little similar to war gaming because it entails a lot of imagination and creative mm-hmm. efforts in that sense I I don't take any offense at that <laughs> it is it is reality you you have to uh, put yourself in a situation and figure out what what is going to happen in fact uh, book 4 which uh, should be out by the end of this month or early next month it actually entailed war gaming to a certain extent not in very excruciating detail but i had to do some of that stuff i hope i've done a decent job of it otherwise uh, we'll have professionals telling me i mean no no you have and uh, i'm going to get two more books of yours and i'll be traveling uh, this weekend so i'll be actually reading that so these are the kind of books i really love to read at once you know mm. binge reading Do tell tell our viewers where they can find your book, how they can purchase it, where they can read it online, right. offline. Right. So uh, my books are available on Amazon. Uh, again, in paperback form as well as e-books. So if you have a Kindle, you can get my books uh, with the click of a button. You know that. Uh, if you prefer the feel of paper and uh, you're like me in that regard, then uh, I have paperbacks on Amazon as well. So I please go ahead and happy reading to you all. Thank you so much for joining me Shonak it's been a lovely conversation with you Thank you so much for having me I enjoyed it thoroughly Thank you